and get an air evacuation out of there, get the helicopters to come in there and get casualties out or something. I worked on the telephone system in Germany after that. Well, I have a question. Hey, I'm wondering here, huh? Yeah, all right. Um, I don't know what type of stories you're interested in. There's one I want to urge you to have. Okay. And that's the story of a buddy of mine that... First thing we do is we have you spell your name, last name first. O-V-E-R-S-T-R-E-E-T. Bill Overstreet's my name. Okay. Branch of service? Army Air Corps at that time. Okay. And rank? I was a captain in uh, 44. Okay. Um, we'll start at the beginning. Um, tell me when you joined up, why you joined up, why the Army Air Corps, um, you know, what was going on in your life, what your family said, sort of that whole story. Well, I was 4F, <laughs> so I could not get in the service. But when December 7th came along, I was able to find a senator from Ohio who had a little, little, little pull and got me in the Army as a private. Applied for cadets, passed the test, and was <coughs> uh, granted cadet status. So, uh, <coughs> I wanted to be a fighter pilot all the time. I was had a single mind. I, that was all it would do for me. I was not qualified for fighter pilot because I was too tall. The minimum, maximum height they were supposed to send to fighters was 5'10". And at that time, before I shrunk, I was six feet. So they say, you're going to twin engine school. No, I can't go to twin engine school. I'm a fighter pilot. I finally talked my way in, all the way through. Did get to uh, Luke Field for single engine training and got my wings. Went to uh, Hamilton Field to uh, join the 357th fighter group when it was formed. So the 357th included a lot of well-known people now. Chuck Yeager, Bud Anderson, Don Bakke, Pete Peterson, all the leading aces around. But as a fighter group, we trained in P-39s and had a lot of fun. As a matter of fact, the more pilots they sent to the 357th, the ones that we're always guilty of buzzing, uh, as we were speaking of, looping the Golden Gate Bridge in formation, or chasing the farmers off the tractors. They were the ones that the CO we had then kept for fighter pilots. Years later, I asked him, Don, why did you pick this group for the pilots that you took overseas? He says, if you were going to combat who would you want to take? The guys that tested the limits of the planes, what they would do, and try, always trying to find out the maximum they could get out of their equipment, or the little guy that was flying straight and level and obeying all regulations. So that's why the 357th was a good outfit. <laughs> What's it like to do a loop around the Golden Gate? Fun. <laughs> well, uh, we would always fly under a bridge rather than over it. And <laughs> but the size of P-39 was a beautiful plane for buzzing. Pilot set up high, and the plane uh, <clears throat> had excellent visibility all around you. And I, we were flying with Lloyd Hubbard at the time. Lloyd was probably our hottest pilot at that time. And he was good. We would buzz and thought we were good, like we could mow the fairways on a golf course with a prop plane. But if we wanted the greens mowed, we'd let Hub do it, because he could fly that close. <laughs> anyway, the 
uh, ones who survived and didn't get switched over to another type outfit because of the way they flew stayed in the 357th as fighter pilots. And when did you all graduate? Uh, you mean get our wings commissioned? Well, I graduated in 43E, cause <clears throat> but uh, Anderson, I think, was two months before that, and uh, so on, all in that, the spring of 44, I mean of 43, spring of 43, we caught our wings. So where did they send you after that? We went to Hamilton Field, then they sent the group to Tonopah, Nevada for gunnery training. Tonopah, if you ever heard of it or seen it or been there, was just a big air base out in the wilds of Nevada, nothing nearby. And, uh, well, there's supposedly some hair, wild hares around, <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> it was an excellent place for gunnery training because if you even accidentally fired the guns, well, it wouldn't have hurt a thing. <laughs> but it was very rough living. Then we went back to uh, Santa Rosa, California. Still P-39 training. And then on up to Oroville, California. And then we went to Casper, Wyoming in the winter time. They're heading toward the winter. And uh, by November 30th, by the end of November, we were in England, shipped across on Queen Elizabeth II. So, uh, How's the trip over November? Uh, North Seas, we went across the North Atlantic, and it got a little choppy and rough, but uh, we were stupid kids and having fun, whatever we did, it didn't matter. <laughs> of course, it was not exactly the luxury liner that it was advertised. <laughs> Had uh, bunks stacked up for sleeping and uh, it only had the bunk available certain hours because they were using them in shifts. Uh, it was rather crowded. And where did you all land? In Scotland. Scotland got on a train and Navigated all the way across England <clears throat> over to a base called Raiden, which was being built. It did not have much pavement anywhere. They had a steel plank runway, one, but we didn't have any airplanes, so that didn't matter. But all the rest of it was just mud, knee deep mud. So, what's the first order that came out from the CO? Dress uniforms will be worn for dinner. Waiting through <laughs> yeah, That was fun, too. How, how long before planes showed up? We finally got to see. We had never seen a P-51. But they finally got a couple P-51s in. And <clears throat> the crew had to be trained to maintain the 51s and <clears throat> when we had a chance to fly them well, we would check out at them and fly for a little bit but I think most of us had less than 10 hours in a 51 when we went on a first combat mission but we were well trained in the 39s we knew about flying and flying fighters uh, during those days there was you know not that much distinction before the planes got there, what did you do? Waited in the mud. <laughs> anyway, they uh, found out that our group was getting P-51s. The 8th Air Force is, oh, we were assigned to the 9th Air Force when we landed in, at Raiden. So they said, we're going to ship a P-47 outfit to Raiden, and you're coming over to Lyston to uh, fly 51s in the 8th Air Force because this we would be the first 51 outfit in the 8th Air Force that way. So we finally landed in Lyston that day and in the night we turned the radio on, Lord ha ha, 
came on and says, Welcome to the boys at Layston. He says, I know you just arrived, and we want to warn you that we're going to give you one hot welcome over here, and don't remember your girlfriends anymore because they're going to be chasing around with other boys. <laughs> That's how we were called Layston. Actually, the base was as close to several other places as it was licensed, but he designated that we were licensed, so we were always called that. What was it, Dan, what was it like that you kept getting closer to that first mission? Uh, we weren't worried about it. We always felt that whatever was going to happen would happen to somebody else, you know, the right attitude. But uh, we were anxious to get on with it. We spent a lot of time training, had excellent training, and we wanted to get in there. The other people had been out shooting planes, and we wanted to get out there. So all of us were quite anxious to get out. Unfortunately, to talk about Lloyd Hubbard, as I mentioned, he was sent out with another group. He was a flight leader. <coughs> so he was sent out with the fourth group, uh, to fly tail in Charlie to get some combat experience. They went down and strafed an airfield, and old Hub coming across fourth of the flight. Every gun in the field was trained, and they killed him. First mission, hot pilot, gone. Tell me about that first mission from the sleepless night before? <laughs> no, no, we slept. <laughs> the sleepless nights came when you uh, came back with a buddy or two missing empty bunks beside you and so forth. They were the hardest night to sleep. In anticipation of a mission, that didn't, that's not anything to keep you awake. So when do they wake you up in the morning, how early? Depend upon the need for the mission. We had a lot of early missions. For instance, on D-Day, our first mission was 2 o'clock takeoff, 2 o'clock a.m. But uh, we didn't have too many of those real early missions because usually the bombers had to take off early. If it was an escort mission, we would <coughs> wait for the bombers to fly over. Then we'd go down and take off and catch them before they got into enemy territory to escort them. So where was your first mission? My first mission went to southern France. Oh, no. They had some mission down there that <coughs> we uh, escorted 17s on a bombing mission into southern France. Eventful? Hmm? Eventful? Well, uh, that was not one of the most eventful ones. I, was, I think we saw about a dozen enemy planes, <coughs> and I think two of them the group shot down. But most of the time they ran away from us. So later on, the missions were really eventful. We were going to Berlin by March, <coughs> and early March we were going to Berlin regularly. That's the reason I named my first plane. I named Southern Bell, being a Virginia boy and so forth. But another fellow flew it one day, and he didn't come back, nor did his plane. So by then we were going to Berlin every day practically. So I called the next one, and all the rest of my planes, the Berlin Express. But when we would go to a place like Leipzig or Berlin, they would mass German fighters by the hundreds to attack the bombers. And <clears throat> one group of us, less than 50, on escort would try to dive in. The Germans would line up in front of where the bombers were coming. The bombers would come along and the Germans up here uh, above them ready to dive in and go through them. But well, we'd have to dive ahead of the bombers and try to break up the Germans so they didn't have any organization to go through the flights of bombers. That would mean 50 of us would be going against from 300 to 
most sometimes five or six hundred German fighters. So we would scatter them and keep them all off balance. You know, well, it was pretty fair. <laughs> As it turned out, uh, I think it was probably the 6th of March, uh, which was one of the earliest uh, Berlin missions. Uh, we knocked down 48 German fighters with a loss of none of ours. We got our first commendation for that mission, I believe. Try to describe to me what happens in a dogfight. Well, the dogfights that happen when you're running into high multiples of German fighters cannot be remembered, cannot be even described because you are so busy. My starting out job was tailing Charlie. I was always the last man in the flight. But I had to protect my element leader, and the element's job was to protect the leader, flight leader. So the flight leader would try to pick the leader of the German planes because he was the key man to get out. And <clears throat> by then, Bud Anderson was the flight leader on most of those missions. Bud would have an excellent eye. He had the knowledge, common sense, intelligence. He could know exactly what to do. And to prove that, he flew oh, several uh, combat tours there. And uh, also, even in Vietnam, he took his son on his wing on a combat mission in Vietnam, still flying fighters. He'd never lost a wingman, never had to bail out, never was shot down. He was the finest fighter pilot in the world, in my language. Anyway, Bud would be out there, but the rest of us had to be sure that none of these other planes could get behind him and shoot him down. So we were diving around, carrying on, and when somebody would, he would concentrate on when he had any sights, uh, some Germans would be coming and we'd cut in and put some bullet holes in that one or anything of that nature to describe him. Sometimes only a tracer across his nose would make him turn away. But whatever it took, we had to get him off our leader's tail. But in all of that, moving around and we were flying upside down, pull it, climbing, diving, uh, rolls, uh, <coughs> shondelling up and all type of maneuvers because whatever the Germans were doing we had to follow. So uh, it was busy time. You can't remember what went on. I've talked to people who said they can remember every detail but I don't see how because you're busy. You don't have time to think and remember everyone's position, nor do you have time to follow a plane after you hit it. Because if you hit a plane, you could have gotten a vital part, but you'd never know, because in the meantime, somebody else was getting on the leader's tail, and you had to get him off of there. You turn away, and this guy could either uh, have to bail out or crash, or he may have flown on land. You don't know and no way to... We weren't interested in following to find out that kind of stuff. We had a job to do and we worked as a team better than anything I've ever seen. Everybody in the group, the crew chiefs, armament, electrical, everybody worked as a team. They would work night and day to make sure our fighters were right <clears throat> because it, it was their plane, the crew, crew chief, that was his plane. He just loaned them to us to fly. But they took such an interest in it. They would have, I don't know what they would have done if they felt that they had failed their job and we didn't come back because of a mechanical failure they hadn't fixed. They were very dedicated. The bond that you have with your ground crew it was great, yeah. And they were so proud of anything a pilot did. And we were so proud of what they did. <laughs> because they were, well, we had our last reunion 
September of 2001. The group's getting too old as antiques don't uh, have enough people of a friends left now to have a big organization. But a certificate was given to all of the people who did not fly. In other words, everybody but the pilots who were part of that group was given a certificate for their service and duty uh, <clears throat> during that period of time. It was one of the finest things we did for the ground crew. Yeah. And I was happy to see that was done. Of course, it was signed by Chuck Yeager and Anderson and so forth, so yeah. that made it more important to them. Absolutely. Tell me about missions that were ground attack missions, where you were strafing and things like that. That was the most dangerous ones. I've always felt they don't give credit for destroying a plane on the ground. And I figured they ought to get double credit for destroying a plane on the ground. Because you got all of them, in addition to the flat guns, they were there too. But in addition to that, every guy on that base is armed and shooting at you. It only takes one bullet. It only takes one bullet in the right place. So uh, I always felt that that was the wrong way to uh, give credit for it destroying planes. But that's my opinion. Who wants to know that? <laughs> anyway, the uh, thrill of ground strafing is just so wonderful. To do it right, you, in my opinion, you have to come in real low because the higher you are, the more people can be shooting at you. So you come in real low, lift up just enough that you can tilt down and fire at the planes on the ground. Or if you can see a flak tower somewhere, you always fire a few shot, shots at the flat, flak tower to try to get them quiet. And uh, then you'll dive down and shoot up any plane or hangar or hopefully some uh, ammunition storage or fuel storage so you can set some fires. But then you leave the field as low as you can so that the fewer guns will be trained on you. And if you go back, you try to come from a different direction and throw them off a little bit. But very few pilots make multiple passes on an enemy airfield strafing. Very few of them live. I did one time. Sounded really silly. I ran into a field that was loaded with the ME-262 German jets. And uh, they were not seen too much in the air at that time. They, later on, they were quite common in the air. But at that time, they were strange-looking things, and I knew we had something there. So H.O. Han was my wingman. That was an element leader by then. And I came across there, and the hand was spread out a little bit, and we uh, punched holes in oh, half a dozen of those jets on the first pass. And I whipped around and went 90 degrees and came back across another pass, punched some holes in a few more of them, and <clears throat> I stayed low and got out away from the field and couldn't find my wingman anywhere. I yelled on the radio, Hand, where are you? He said, I'm giving you top cover. <laughs> he didn't go back for that second part. <laughs> Smart man. <laughs> Tell me about some of the missions where, where either you were hit or you hit somebody. Well, a lot of missions I hit somebody. And, uh, to, yeah, that was why I was there. <laughs> but uh, you could get a burst in here and a burst in there and so forth. You always, after that first mission, usually a pilot, fighter pilot on his first mission will hold the trigger down too long. And in over a second or so, you hold it many seconds, you're going to melt the gun barrels because the 
machine guns fired too many uh, rounds so fast. As a matter of fact, you only had a few seconds of ammunition if you held the <laughs> trigger down. But uh, by uh, giving a real short burst, click, click, you could get you concentrated fire where you wanted it. And uh, you could get a few hits. Sometimes you were able to get the uh, engine on fire or you'd get the coolant streaming out of a 109, or you would knock the canopy off a 190 and he would bail out, or something of that nature. But uh, all of those things are possible, and everything, every one, every incident is different. But uh, I was hit several times. One harrowing experience, 20, mil 20 millimeter shell, uh, came through, took my canopy off, caught my helmet in the back of my neck, took my helmet, oxygen mask, and all that stuff off. Gave me a haircut and a neck burn. <clears throat> but uh, other than that, it was fine. I was able to recover from the flame being whopped around because of the hit and uh, come on back home safely, so no big deal. The proverbial close shave. That was a close shave. Of course, I've had plenty of others that were probably more dangerous. I'm bitter today because my claim to fame came because I passed out. I was in Time Magazine and Lowell Thompson radio program and everything. The first burst of flak came up, shot my oxygen line out. And there I was close to 30,000 feet with no oxygen suddenly. I did what was normal. I passed out. And I <clears throat> came to an hour and a half later, 90 minutes. I stayed in that plane and unconscious the whole period. But when I regained consciousness, the plane had a dead engine because it had run out of gas on the tank it was switched to. It was in a spin, going down fast. So I came to, switched to another tank, got the engine going, recovered from the spin and pulled out, picking up leaves in the air scoop because it was in the trees by then. So that was another close call. And where were you when you... When I don't, don't know where I was. I, know, I knew where I was when I was hit. And I knew what heading I had. So I assumed that I flew in that general direction, so I reversed that and flew back and was able to find the English Channel. Then I landed at the fourth group. At this point, you're all alone. Oh, yeah. Yeah, strictly alone. And <clears throat> the uh, fourth group was the base that I picked because I was low on fuel. I couldn't get back to my home base. I landed. The interesting story to that, the intelligence officer who de debriefed me and got this story was a neighbor of mine from Clifton Forge, Virginia. He lived on the same street I did. In the, the mechanic who repaired the damage to the plane was a boy from Clifton Forge High School, Hotshot Tucker, that I played basketball with. Small world. That's the way it happens in wartime. Absolutely. But it was a very, very exciting time. And the friendships we made are still quite real. Uh, went to Oshkosh this summer, and Bud Anderson put me in his 51, and he and, he and Chuck were flying two different 51s for the air show at Oshkosh. He put me in the cockpit, and you sit there until I tell you. <laughs> Jaeger was on the wing and talking to me. <clears throat> that was a real thrill. But we we get along pretty good. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> to, to go and get back in one of those planes just must be an amazing thing. Well, after all these years, and so they're still flying him all the you know, all the time. 
And, uh, well, I, I got to fly one back in 91. If I loaned one from Philadelphia, let me fly his 51 in Georgia. And that was a thrill. Uh, was that all you remember? <laughs> no, I lost confidence in it. I, uh, I do not want to try to solo on a 51 right now. I, I've forgotten more than I know. <laughs> yeah, they are. Uh, tell me about D-Day. D-Day was, of course, as you know, postponed. I happened to be in London, and they rounded me up and said, get back to the base. They dragged me back to the base. And this was the 4th of June because they planned on flying D-Day on the 5th. The weather was horrible. They postponed it a day. Thought the weather would be better. Well, if, if it was, it wasn't much better because it was a miserable day. Took off at two o'clock in the morning on our first mission. Climbed through the overcast to 20,000 feet on instruments. And we never did get their flights properly organized. Always assigned with a flight leader and a, his wingman, element leader and his wingman. We never got it organized that way because all these planes would, put, once you got out into the moonshine and moonlight and everything was so beautiful on top of that. But uh, there's plane pop up here and a plane pop up here because they'd all been on instruments all the way up from, 20, 000, from the ground to 20,000. Anyway, we'd find enough friends to get together into a flight of four and go over to handle the mission. First thing we had to do is make sure no German aircraft got to interfere with the landing. <clears throat> that was not too difficult because Germans didn't put up with two planes, so that was easy. But uh, then we had to <clears throat> go back later their second mission was a spot deal. We were trying to uh, fly close support to the invasion troops, come down and strafe the Germans who were in front of our troops to try to make it easier for the troops to advance. And the third mission, they asked us to go a little deeper and stop any movement of the Germans toward the front, try to knock out any truck or barge or any kind of thing that was moving toward the front, make sure they couldn't resupply the enemy. So uh, it was a, a very eventful day, but not in aircraft. We didn't have any dogfights or anything on D-Day. So if, if mission number one, essentially, there was no need, you went to <coughs> strafe and close, what did you see? Could you tell much about what was going on? It looked like that when we'd cross the channel, you could walk across the channel. There were so many ships there that it looked like it was packed full. It was a sight you'll never forget. And get close to the coast uh, where the poor boys had to land, it, it was a hellish sight. It was just horrible to watch. German pillboxes were all on top of the hills, firing straight down at them, and they had to cross the beach and all that fire. Very unpleasant situation for them. But <clears throat> we did the best we could. I wish we could have done more. When you were into the third part going inland, what did you see there? Were there indeed Germans trying oh to yeah, them. yeah. There was uh, quite a lot of movement. Uh, convoys, rail cars, uh, barges, and uh, all types of movement that were advancing in that direction that we could stop. Of course, you have to be careful with strafing railroads. You could punch holes in an engine, steam engine. You see all that steam blow off and everything looks so exciting. 
years later we found out that they had patch kits for those things and got them going back again real soon. We weren't doing that much damage, just put punching holes in the steam engine. But uh, if you move back down the train and happen to hit a ammunition loaded car or fuel transport and they blow up, uh, that can be dangerous because you might be flying through the same thing as shrapnel. Yeah, I've uh, seen aerial photography and yeah. I look at it and go, um, <laughs> now you get to fly through what you just blew up. Yeah, that's such that's, that's dangerous stuff. Yeah. But uh, we destroyed hundreds and hundreds of trains. Lots and lots of moving vehicles, barges, they'd burn, most of them would burn very nicely. How long did that initial mission hold over Normandy? Well, <clears throat> each of those missions were about six hours. We were flying 18 hours that day. <clears throat> the group flew more because they broke up into smaller sections and one squadron would go and <clears throat> hit this area and another squadron go and hit this area. The group itself flew seven missions. But each, uh, my, as an individual, I only flew th three six-hour missions on D-Day. Was it the sight of the ships that was the most memorable? The sight of the ships was the first thing we saw <coughs> that was so uh, impressive. Looked like that the whole water was covered with ships. But uh, when you got a glimpse of what was going on the coast, that was the worst thing to see, where the landing was. <clears throat> Some of the ships had been sunk or were sinking well offshore. And uh, the ones that did get close, the poor fellows had to be wading ashore while being shot at all the time. Very unpleasant. As they moved inland towards San Lo and went, did you all just keep extending your missions, yep. following them? Mm -hmm. when, <clears throat> when did you finally get a base over there? Did you actually go to France and no? We did not. The Ninth Air Force <coughs> moved to bases in France. As the troops moved ahead, if they would uh, recover a German air base, they would send a group from the Ninth Air Force in to base there. They could give them the close air support uh, that way. And we were still uh, a lot of time covering bombers trying to knock out ball bearing factories and oil refineries and airplane factories, everything, that, industrial complex. Did you fly support for the big bombing run for San Lo? They took so many planes over and pounded it. Uh, no, <clears throat> that uh, was not in their mission. When you're in a dogfight, how do you keep orientation of where you are? Who cares? You, where you are is where you've got is where you've got to be to do your job. And very seldom is that ever straight and level. In other words, everybody, if you start firing, he's taking evasive action. You have to take the evasive action to follow him. He's upside down. You know one of the most exciting things to see is two planes, German, American, coming straight at each other, head on past, both of them upside down. And when you see something like that and they get in there, of course sometimes they do hit. A friend of mine uh, was a group commander and he says, never break, the Germans will always break. You just fire straight at him as long as you can because he'll try to get out of the way. He met a German who had the same idea. Crash. They woke up. Both of them survived. 
woke up in the hospital bed side by side. They both survived. Both survived. <clears throat> It is. But there were amazing things happening every day. Unbelievable things. Who would believe that I could be flying uh, well, on a mission where we had a lot of German opposition, but we'd scattered the German fighters pretty good. And after most of them were gone, we had an opportunity to chase the last ones. When they were diving for the ground, we could dive after them. So 109 was one of the last ones going down, and I tacked on to him, full power dive, and uh, all of a sudden my eyes were swollen shut. I had a sinus infection. My eyes were swollen shut and I was blinded. Well, three days later, the doctors were finally able to get my eyes open again. But in the meantime, I called my buddy, Daddy Ravi Peters, who was my wingman, I said, Daddy Rabbit, you got to lead me back home. I can't see anything anymore. He said, no problem. So he just tucked on my wing. And of course, I knew, you know, by the feel, whether I was climbing or diving and so forth. But he just guided me. He says, turn a little bit to the right, get the right heading. Flew me all the way back to Lyston. Flew me in, take me down. I said, put the wheels down now, put the wheels down. And he says, you're about 10 feet from the ground, get ready to land. Landed no problem blind. I hadn't seen a thing since Germany. So, uh, they let you go back up again? Oh, yeah. Oh, the time when I was uh, landed at the fourth uh, fighter group, the uh, medical officer, air flight surgeon, I said, you ought to be grounded a while. I says, you can't fly for a while. I says, okay, I got to get the plane back. He said, oh, well, you can get from field to field. So uh, I climbed in the plane after it was repaired, went back to Lysa, and was flying a mission the next day. Uh, <laughs> who cares? <laughs> <clears throat> they didn't like it when I came back with barbed wire wrapped around the tail of my plane one time. How did you get so low you got barbed wire? Well, that's where the German was. I was trailing a 190 that time, and he could fly that thing low, and I had to fly low if I was going to have a chance at him. And the tail got low enough it goes through a barbed wire fence and snaps and wraps around the tail. They took a dim view of that. They said, you're grounded. I said, yes, sir. I said, don't you need somebody to fly tomorrow? He, oh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so I was flying the next day, too. Did they come up with a new <laughs> nickname for you after the barbed wire? No. What was your nickname? Oh, I've been called many things. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have any particular <laughs> name that stuck. <laughs> how, did you all, how did you all deal with, as you said, when you got back and looked and there's... An empty bed. That was tough. It was very tough. Uh, <clears throat> Joe Pierce had a bunk one side of me, and Bill McKaylee had a bunk the other side of my bunk in this hut. We were living high then. We are out of tents in Tequanza huts. But uh, one mission, Andy and I, Pierce and McKaylee, or <clears throat> strafing trains, and both of them got hit. And Pierce flew straight into the engine. McKaylee was captured, and the both of them were gone on the same mission. Left a big vacancy one on each side of me. The one that was captured going to PIW camp. Yeah. Come out? Yeah. <clears throat> After being uh, mistreated for a while at first, then he was accepted and became a regular prisoner. The Germans let him alone after that. They were very happy for a while. But Between missions, you get to go into London and 
see any of uh, I made several excursions to London, one excursion to Scotland. So uh, they were my outings in the year that I was over there. Of course, we had a lot of exciting trips. I definitely want to get this point across. Eddie Simpson and I went through cadets together, were shipped into the group together. Flew uh, all the training missions together, went overseas together, and uh, we were good buddies. But while I was on a shuttle mission to Russia, he did not go on that mission and got into a mid-air collision. The Army listed him as killed in the collision, which would have been expected. But he survived practically unhurt. And, uh, <coughs> he was able to get his chute open and land. Got hooked up with the French Marquis. And they said, well, this was in August of 44. He said, the American lines are not too far away, but we're gonna have to wait until they can get a break in this German lines, which were between the Marquis and the American lines. So he stayed with them and fought with them. He was fighting the Germans with, on the ground like an infantryman. The Germans located the nest of the French underground, came after them in full force. They had a large group of Germans attacking where the underground had their equipment stored and so forth. So the Marquis fellows, the underground, got all together, loaded up what they could on their, their vehicles, which the only thing they had they had stolen from the Germans. So they were running down an old narrow road and the Germans were gaining on them. They didn't have a prayer unless something happened. Well, Eddie and a couple French marquis jumped off the back of this last vehicle, set up a machine gun in the middle of the road and were able to disable the lead German vehicle, which blocked the road and let the rest of the French marquis get away. Of course, those three were killed by setting up a stationary position in the middle of a road against the German army. But uh, we didn't know that story for nearly 20 years. And we finally tied the records together and the French had erected a monument to this uh, hero from the West and who finally got the story pitched, pieced together. But they're the kind of things that most people will never hear the real true heroism. Did Eddie get a medal? No. But that isn't what he did it for. He was a real hero. Don't hear it, man. <laughs> Incidentally, while that was going on, they sent us to escort the bombers on a shuttle mission, they call it. They call from England, fly a mission at this particular one was over Poland. The bombs are dropped in Poland. And we <clears throat> ran into a few fighters and uh, shot a few of them down. One of which came to one of our reunions years later. Want to know why we didn't kill him when they had him, uh, his plane disabled. <laughs> That's a good side story. But uh, we went on to Russia. They didn't send up the pilot plane to guide us in. So somehow we had to find a grass field in Russia after a combat mission to land. The fighter group sent a mechanic as a gunner on the bombers so that he'd be able to, you know, take care of the fighter planes do any minor repairs that were necessary. Of course, the bombers landed at one field, and we landed at another field, and we never saw our mechanics. But... <clears throat> That was all right. We flew a mission out of Russia back into Germany and uh, spent a day or so. Then the next mission was from Russia to Italy. And we <coughs> had a mission close to the Palestine oil fields on that route. Well, while we were in Russia, they, we located some uh, beet vodka as a little pinkish flavor. 
color to it, and it tasted different than the regular potato vodka. And I thought the boys back home would like some of that, so I took the ammunition out of the ammunition cans, loaded it with beet vodka. And I was leading the flight that time, and we got close to Pulaski, we ran into a dozen or so 109s. So I pulled over, it was the closest one to them, and the rest of them ran away, we couldn't catch them because we had to stay with the bombers. But one of the last guys of the 109s rolled over and bailed out. Nobody fired or shot at him or anything else. I guess he got scared that we were gonna catch him or maybe he had engine trouble, who knows. Anyway, he rolled over and bailed out and we got to Italy and landed and they said, well, who was the closest one to the guy that bailed out? I could have gotten credit for another plane. I didn't have a round of ammunition. <laughs> no telling what would happen. Anyway, the only thing I had to worry about was making a smooth landing at Foggia, Italy. I, I had liquid product. <laughs> yeah, but I made a good landing. It was, it was successful. But that's another thing that brings to mind. Well, we flew some out missions out of Italy. And one of the most impressive sights I have ever seen was we went to Yugoslavia, took some C-47s over to Yugoslavia. They captured a German field, top of a mountain there in Yugoslavia. Tito had rounded up the downed airmen that he could get away from the Germans and so forth. Rounded them up to this airfield. And we could <coughs> go into C-47, pick up a bunch, another C-47, and pick up another bunch. But as we were covering them overhead, in case anybody came near. Those downed airmen would jump into C-47, throw their shoes, their clothes, and everything back for their partisans of Yugoslavia. People ought to know about that. Oh, no. I've got hundreds of... <laughs> you don't know nothing yet. <laughs> See, I'll tell you about flying. Pete Peterson came back with his flight after a combat mission. And, as usual, the field was socked in. And it wasn't socked in too bad. It was only 5,000 feet or something. But it's clear about that. And... He had no other fields of land. Everything around there was socked in, just all the way to the ground, practically. He says, now, I got an idea. He says, Tower, shoot a flare straight up from where you are in the field. So when he saw that flare come up, he started in orbit and measured the feet per second and so forth as he's going down and he got down to the ground, he could see where he was on the field. He, could see, he found the field by circling right around it. So he said, <clears throat> okay. He went back up and took his wingman on his wing. Fire another flare. Fire straight up. He went through the same maneuver, same feet per second, descent, brought him around, got him on the runway and let his wingman land. Went back up, picked up the element leader and the tail end Charlie. Uh, each a single person down each trip. Uh, <clears throat> then when he took the last one down, he also landed. Now that's a navigating man. Yeah. <clears throat> that, was that has been written up many times because it's so unusual that you can find somebody that is that steady to uh, measure the exact descent and number of turns, the degree of angle and everything and come back to the same spot three times. Absolutely amazing. Because there had to be times you came back for it with the Oh yeah. Down. You know, that was that way uh, most of the time. But uh, that, that's something that uh, he's real proud of and we're real proud of him for being able to accomplish that. How many missions did you all fly before they said you can go home? 
that changed <laughs> every day. <laughs> Not quite, but it changed all the time. The uh, fighters, the bombers, would be 25 missions, 30 missions. They kept extending that too. But uh, the fighters, they added first mission in sorties, then they added in uh, hours, and <clears throat> then they uh, had some combination of long missions and short missions. I never knew. I flew until the ground had been sent me home. It was about the equivalent of a couple of tours. Did you know that you were working towards a point, or did they just come up one day and say, you're going home? No, they came up to me and said, you're grounded. I was, <clears throat> I was out of it. I, uh, stomach had been shot uh, from uh, high altitude flight, <clears throat> stretched the, I used to have to loosen my seat belt, and then of course I couldn't get the stick back all the way because my stomach would blow up and all that kind of stuff. Had lots of problems, the oxygen and uh, all that stuff. <clears throat> Once they found out enough about it, uh, they sent me home, and then I still got back on flying status. After the war, I was a squadron commander of a gunnery school in Pinellas, Florida. That was a cream puff of a job. <laughs> I think deserved it by then, you? That was fun. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Do you have one quick story? Uh, one thing about P-39s, if we can go back, in training, P-39 uh, will tumble. Center gravity was wrong. The engine was behind the pilot. <clears throat> Any over control or anything the P-39 didn't like, it would tumble and then go into a flat spin. And <clears throat> I do not know how to get out of the shenanigans that they're in. And when it happened to me, it tumbled and uh, I couldn't, I released the doors, they were free. But in these attitudes the plane was in, the pressure was against the doors holding them on. It had two side doors open for access to the cockpit. I finally got a shoulder against one door and a knee against the other, overcame the pressure, got out. Pulled the rib cord immediately. And the chute was very kind, it billowed full, jerked me to a stop. It just happened that I was standing on the ground when that happened. It jerked me to a stop when I was landing. Same place the plane did, right in the same middle of the wreckage. But uh, that was another close call. Yeah. <laughs> so you landed as all the pieces were landing around yeah. you? Matter of fact, I could lean on the prop. A good time to close. Yeah, that's a great story. Absolutely wonderful. Um, I thank you for coming today. Y your stories are the ones that we look for. <laughs> I, will, I will tell you that. I, I really do. Appreciate what you did back then. I appreciate well, you coming today. Uh, I appreciate what the boys did and the teamwork we had. It was wonderful. Yeah, it was. No. And it worked too, didn't it? Yeah. Sure did. Thank you very much.